I really briefly went on the Nearpod again. I think I see how this LAR is doing that. So I'm going to try my best before Rad Pro 2 to try to send you guys the answers and all that stuff. So when we review, you'll be able to see a little more clearly. So we'll see what I can do. I can't promise, but we'll see what I can do. But I will get that figured out definitely before our next test. <laughs> Copy and pasting. Okay. I'll see what I can do. All right. So we're going to start our next chapter. We won't get too far today. But this is going to be chapter 15. Come on. Come on, WebEx. There we go. So this is chapter 15. In this chapter, we're going to be focusing on vital signs, oxygen, some procedures for the chest, and of course, lines. Now, this is something that will, this, this chapter will accompany another one of your practicums. We're still working out the dates on those practicums, but one of your upcoming practicums, once we find an actual date and location for it, will be taking proper vital signs, such as blood pressure, pulse, um, oxygen, breath rate, things like that. So that'll come as soon as we can get a location. But very important stuff to learn, and a lot of people, especially rad techs, think, well, isn't that kind of what nurses do? I don't really ever have to do that, right? Well, it all really depends on where you work. If you work in a hospital environment, you're not so much going to be in charge of the vital signs. That's mostly going to fall on the nurse's shoulders. But if you were to work at a clinic, for example, depending on what clinic you work at, the actual rad tech may be involved in doing those vital signs. Where one of my first jobs I applied for was going to be like that. It was a very small clinic. And I remember when I was on the interview, they were telling me, yeah, it's uh, alongside doing your x-rays, every patient that comes in, you got to do their vital signs, you got to document, you got to do all this, this blood pressure, oxygen, breath rate, all that wonderful stuff. So it can possibly be part of your job. Thus, we do need to make sure we understand it. We got to learn it. And we got to know about those breath rates, those pulse rates, diastolic, systolic pressure. We're going to go through all that wonderful stuff. I do want you guys to really pay attention to this chapter because this, I would say this chapter right here is the stuff people forget the most when it comes to their registry. Because your registry will throw random questions at you, like saying, what's the average breath rate for an adult male? What's the average blood pressure for an adult female? Things like that. And if you're like me, you hate numbers. I'm not a numbers guy. I'm a words guy. And those numbers will slip through your mind, slip through your brain. So when you see us going through some of these numbers... And if you can put big stars by those that you don't forget them, I know for a fact the registry likes to throw some of those random patient care questions on your registry. And from the statistics that we get every year, more often than not, the most missed questions on the registry are patient care questions because people tend to take the class for granted. It's an easier class overall. But a lot of that info, you see it once, you forget about it, you never revisit it. So definitely don't do that because you will see this stuff reemerge again and again. So first thing we're going to talk about, I can get this thing to get on my way here. There we go. Homeostasis. So we have five major mechanisms for homeostasis. First thing we got to do is actually define that term. The exact definition for homeostasis is relatively stable equilibrium between interdependent elements, especially maintained by physiological processes. And the five major ways that our body is going to achieve homeostasis is through heartbeats, blood pressure, body temperature, respiratory rate, and electrolyte balance. All those have to be at a certain level to maintain what we call homeostasis, that equilibrium within the body. If anything, anything, any of these things are off, such as an irregular heartbeat, obviously there's a condition going on, something's happening. Irregular blood pressure, we got to figure out what's going on. Body temperature, we get a fever, we're going out of homeostasis because we're getting sick. Respiratory rate, tachycardia, bradycardia, different types of breath rates, are going to put us out of that homeostatic stasis. So all these must be at a certain level to achieve what we call homeostasis or an equilibrium amongst our bodily functions. So I'm sure most of you as a kid, 
have done this very thing right here. When we're talking about vital signs. Is what we all pretended to do as kids. If you ever had a doctor kit, I know my kids do it all the time. My kids do exams on me all the time. I just uh, my kids have taken my blood pressure. They've taken my temperature with the toys. They've even done operations on me. Some crazy, crazy stuff. But it is, like I said, a vital part of what we do to think of your work. So we got to make sure we know how to do each of these vital signs properly. And we've got to know the average numbers that go along and coincide with each of those different vital signs. Because part of your, your um, practicum is not only performing it, but making sure you know if your patient, which would be one of your classmates, is in the average range for like blood pressure, respiratory rate, pulse, so on and so forth. So the five major vital signs that we will take on our patients would be body temperature, pulse rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and mental state. We throw mental state in there. That actually is considered a vital sign, something we have to actually document and watch out for, especially on our elderly patients, our Alzheimer's patients, our dementia patients. Making note of that mental state is very, very important as far as making a clear assessment of those differing vital signs. So most have heard the first four. A lot of people don't group mental state in there, but that is considered the fifth vital sign that we do check in the hospital and clinic environments. And of course, checking those lines. We're going to learn a little bit more about this as we move forward as well. A lot of our patients are going to come and present with these different cardiac lines. We're going to learn what each of those cardiac lines do, how they're labeled, what they're actually measuring, and what we need to look for if we were to walk into a room. And, for example, if you walk into an ICU room, you see a patient with all these leads on, and something's buzzing and beeping. I think I've told you this before. You're not just going to walk away and say, hey, nurse, they're beeping. You need to come fix this. You as a tech... As an advocate for your patient, as a healthcare worker, you should be able to recognize something's going on on that cardiac monitor and either silence it and fix the lead, look on the patient's chest, make sure the leads are all connected. And if you're completely lost, yeah, you would communicate to the nurse, but we should be able to recognize if something's going on, especially if one of those leads comes unhooked. Because that does happen a lot. They become unhooked. And you'll start hearing those beeping sounds constantly. You're never just going to ignore that and walk away. That's something you've got to recognize and step in and work on depending on the situation that's going on. So here's some of our normal vital sign rates here, guys. A lot of numbers coming at you, but we do need to know all of these specific numbers. When we talk about temperature, the average normal temperature to get that homeostasis or equilibrium for that vital sign would be 97.7 degrees to 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Now obviously, you see 99.5, it's a more elevated temperature. We usually say it's a low-grade fever. That still falls within what we call the normal temperature range of homeostasis or equilibrium. So don't be fooled by that. A lot of people see 99.5 and be like, oh, my God, they got a fever. That's, um, that's not normal. That is considered in the normal range. If it goes above that, that's the abnormal range. For respirations, so do make note there is a clear difference between adult breaths per minute and child breaths per minute. An adult, on average will breathe 12 to 20 breaths per minute versus a child. They're going to breathe more at a 20 to 30 breath per minute rate. Especially with babies, you'll see babies, they breathe quite fast. And then for pulse rate, there's also a difference on the pulse rate between an adult and a child. When we're taking an adult's pulse rate, that's going to be 60 to 100 BPM. BPM does stand for beats per minute. For a child, that's going to be at the 70 to 120 beats per minute range. It's a little bit of difference there, but there is a difference between an adult and child. Make sure you know the difference between those two sets of numbers. And then for blood pressure, we have the systolic and diastolic measurements. We're going to go over those more specifically as we specify each of these vital signs. But the normal blood pressure range would be 120 over 80, systolic 120, diastolic 80, in millimeters of mercury. HG stands for mercury. And all those are going to be what we call that homeostasis equilibrium for each of those vital signs. It's that average rate that we look for on our patients. We also can write those down. Now, 
always hate to say you gotta memorize numbers because I hate numbers myself. But these are very important that we go ahead and memorize. Do not forget these rates because they will throw some of those questions at you on your registry of what the average rate should be for each of those vital signs. Okay, so body temperature. So once again, we're looking for that average rate of 97 to 99.5. Uh, most commonly, that average is going to be about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And we do use Fahrenheit here in the States. Other countries typically use Celsius, but we do love to use Fahrenheit here. Now, hypothalamus, the hypothalamus, which is in the brain, plays a specific role in thermoregulation. That's the regulation of temperature. So if we have a temperature that's low versus a temperature that's high, the hypothalamus is going to activate in the brain and produce a certain response in the body. So obviously, if we're cold, if our temperature is low, the hypothalamus is going to activate that function within the body that we call shivering. If we're too hot, we get a fever, for example, the body's going to react by actually having a sweat. So low temperature is going to activate shivering. A high temperature will activate sweating. Both of those are regulated by the hypothalamus in the brain. That's what we call thermoregulation. So how would we measure this temperature? We have five main routes of measurement. Oral is going to be the one that's most common. You know about putting a temperature in your mouth. Also, axillary. Axillary refers to under your armpit. That's usually the most common way you do it at home. Tympanic would be on the temple, the temporal artery, and then the rectal method. Of those five, does anybody know which of those five is the most accurate method of measurement for temperature? Rectal. That is correct. Um, rectal. It's actually rectal. Even though that's the most unpleasant way to receive a temperature reading, that is the most accurate reading. And as a matter of fact, most patients that come into the trauma room, when they're doing a temperature reading, they will most often opt for that rectal reading over anything else because it's going to give that really accurate temperature reading immediately so they can make sure that patient doesn't have a fever or a low temperature. So rectal would be the most accurate method of reading temperature, those five. Not the preferred method, but the most accurate. And most of you do know, sometimes depending on the method, you have to make small adjustments to the temperature. I'm sure most of you know, especially if you have kids, when you do that axillary method, what do you do? You add a degree to the readout. You add plus one to it to get the more accurate reading. All right, when we're talking about abnormal temperatures, we have two, th two terms, two definitions we got to know here. If our temperature is below that average of 97.7 degrees Fahrenheit, they're going to exhibit what we call hypothermia. Conversely, if that temperature is above 99.5 and they have an elevated fever, they're going to have what we call hyperthermia. Hyperthermia. One way to remember that is, yeah, this one is really hyper energetic. If they're jumping around, going all over the place, where are they doing? They're getting hot, they're sweating. They're getting an elevated temperature. So hyperthermia would be that elevated temperature. Also goes by the term what we call febrile. It's another way to state that exact same thing, febrile. So obviously, if we have prolonged hyperthermia, that can be very, very dangerous. So if someone presents with a temperature of, say, 103 degrees Fahrenheit, often what they're going to do is you'll see them packing ice on a patient. This has happened a lot in the trauma room. Someone will come in with a really high temperature. You may have a child coming in with a super high temperature. They always say if your child has like 104 fever, bring them to the hospital immediately because it can be very dangerous. The reason for that is the body will actually begin to cook itself in a lot of ways. The brain can actually receive brain damage if there's that elevated temperature for a very long time and won't reduce that temperature. So if you ever see in a hospital, in a trauma room, they're packing ice on a patient, usually it's because that temperature is extremely high. It's at a dangerous level. We cannot leave the body at that temperature for a very long time or that brain damage will occur. You remember that commercial from back in the 90s, your brain on drugs, they show the egg frying? 
same concept. Your brain's like frying like an egg if you have that prolonged temperature for way too long. No one remembers that commercial? That was a popular commercial when I was a kid. Are y'all too young for that? A few, few of you won't remember it. Okay. Okay. And of course, respiratory rate, guys, we're going to go on to that now. Talk a little bit more about the averages of respiratory rate and the different conditions that present with that when it goes above or below the average rates. So first thing we're going to talk about here, a lot more definitions coming up, is what we call minute ventilation. And what this simply is, it's predicted on respiratory rate and depth of breath versus tidal volume. That's going to be the lung volume, representing the normal volume of air displaced between normal inhalation and exhalation when extra effort is not applied. So basically just normal breathing is going to be what we call tidal volume, the inhalation and exhalation at a normal rate when we're not actually straining or struggling to breathe, just that normal breathing rate, tidal volume. Minute is a prediction of the actual respiratory rate. So you walk in just want to guess what that respiratory rate is, you can be predicting minute ventilation. And this is back to Rad Pro One, guys. If you remember, as far as the inhalation versus exhalation, make sure you do remember what happens to the rib cage and also what does happen to the diaphragm. So, if you remember, when we're inhaling, the lungs are expanding, the rib cage is also expanding, but the diaphragm is moving down. It's actually moving down and flattening. This is what we call a diaphragm contraction. It is a muscle. Versus when we exhale, the lungs become smaller because the air is escaping. The lungs become smaller, the rib cage becomes smaller as it relaxes, and that diaphragm is going to relax by moving up in an arch. So when people still get that confused, when the diaphragm's in an arch, that's a relaxation phase. When it's flat, that's actually a contraction phase. Make sure you know the difference between those two. That does come back time and time again in our classes, that diaphragm movement. Okay, and we do have a inspiratory phase versus expiratory phase. Obviously, the inspiratory phase is then. The expiratory phase would be when we breathe out, whether we're doing that naturally or a machine's doing it for us, because some people in the hospital, a machine is doing that for them. Now, our respiratory rates are measured by BPM, breaths per minute, and there's those numbers once again there, guys. For an adult, that's going to be 12 to 18 beats per minute. For children under 10, 18 to 25, an infants in particular don't have the fastest breath rate. An infant would be 30 to 40 breaths per minute. So we got a little more complicated there, broke it down a little further. Make sure you do know those different rates between adults, children under 10, and infants, little babies. They're going to breathe very, very fast. And you'll see them in the hospital, especially when you're going to use, watch their chest. They're breathing very rapidly, very rapidly. That is normal. That's their normal breath rate. Do you want us to remember for adults 12 to or 12 to 18? Say it again, Jonathan. You were cutting out. So I just saw an adult said 12 to 18. Um, so I remember on the first line it said 12 to 20. Is that yeah. 12, 12 to 18, 12 to 20. You're going to see that variation on those numbers. It's quite common, but basically 12 to 20 is your range. Yeah, you can use either one. 12 to 18, 12 to 20. If it, fall, if it goes above 20, that's bad, though. We don't want it to be above 20. Yeah. And like I said, you're going to see that happen in the NICU a lot. A lot of these babies, their breath rates have to be controlled. If they're breathing too fast or too slow, you're going to see them hooked up to ventilation machines, and you're going to see that rapid breathing on a lot of your infants. And also with adults, they can be intubated. Um, Tracy, did you say you were intubated too, or was it just an NG2? Were you intubated as well? You were? So was that just as unpleasant as the NG tube? Yes? No? I would, I would guess so, yes. Yeah. Yes. So obviously it's very miserable because you have a tube going all the way down your trachea, a tube breathing for you in your lungs, 
definitely a very uncomfortable thing to have. A lot of times there are patients that are in critical conditions, something really major has happened, they can't breathe on their own, so they're going to be what we call intubated, intubated to actually control that breath rate and make sure it's within that average homeostatic range. So where are we going to... I wanted to pull it out. What's that? I wanted to pull out the thing because, like, it was in my throat. Yeah, it's... So. Yeah. That gives me goosebumps. Can't imagine. Can't imagine. So what are we looking for as far as breath rate, guys? What are we actually measuring? We obviously are measuring that breath rate, but we also look at what we call the depth. We want to see how deep and how shallow those breaths are when they're actually breathing. We watch the rise and fall of the chests. So we're going to document whether it's shallow, normal, or deep. And this right here is actually something very important to remember, guys, when you're doing chest x-rays. Because a lot of your patients, you go, you go in there and you say, hey, take a big, deep breath, blow it out, take another big, deep breath and hold it, sometimes, if you haven't seen it yet, your patients can't achieve the deep breath. They're breathing very shallow. So you as a tech would document that on your chest x-ray that the patient had very shallow breathing. Even though you attempted to get that deep breath, it wasn't possible because they did present with the very shallow breathing. So it is something we'll often document on chest x-rays. And then we're also going to document the pattern, if it's a regular breathing pattern or if it's irregular. If they're breathing super, super fast, or super slow, or if they're struggling to get that breath in, like they breathe in, they're coughing, they're choking on their own air, like they just can't get that breath in, that would be abnormal in regular patterns that we're going to document. So this breathing thing, even if we're outside the realm of taking vital signs, because we do so many chest x-rays, a lot of these things that we look for on vital signs for breathing, we would document on our actual chest x-rays because we actually see that when we ask them to do the breathing instructions for each chest x-ray. So you would go in there and say, hey, irregular breathing, shallow breathing, um, bad breath rate on chest x-ray. And that's why I'm not able to achieve that 10 ribs on my chest x-ray on the lungs. You know, I really tried. It just wasn't possible because they have a very abnormal breathing pattern or very shallow breathing. So some of our abnormalities here, a few more definitions. These are some specific abnormalities for breathing. Tachypnea. Is going to be abnormally rapid breathing. So they're breathing really fast, almost like they're hyperventilating. That's tachypnea. Versus brady, bra that's a hard one to say, bradyp bradypnea. I always have trouble saying that word. Bradypnea is going to be the abnormally slow breathing. So tachy is fast. Brady is slow. Dyspnea, you'll see that a lot on patients' order forms. It's what we call difficult or labored breathing. Furthermore, dyspnea actually breaks down to another term of what we call orth orthopnea. Orthopnea is shortness of breath when you're actually laying flat in a supine position. When you see that term there, by the way, S-O-B, that does not mean a curse word, like many of you may be thinking, S-O-B, it actually refers to shortness of breath. Very common terminology used on order forms. If you ever see S-O-B, they're not being insulted on the order form. <laughs> They're actually being documented for shortness of breath. And then apnea, the final definition there would be an actual cessation of breathing. They're not breathing at all, and we're having to actually induce CPR because they're not breathing. That would be apnea. Another difference between all, well, five, all five of those terms right there, guys. Very important definitions. And with that, guys, we are out of time. It is 10.14. So we will pick back up on Friday and keep moving through this chapter. A little bit longer chapter than we're used to. A lot more information to get through. Um, do make note, guys, that the time does change on Friday. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, our class is at 10.15 on Friday now because we had to change the lab times. So make sure you know when that time is. Am I correct? Was it 10.15? I'll have to double check. I think it's 10. You guys remember? I think it's 10.30. I think it's 10.30. 10.30? Okay, I'll double check. Thank you. So 10.30, I'll, I'll make sure. All right, guys, enjoy your next class, and I will see you all at 1 o'clock, and we'll go over our next tests. Take care. Bye-bye.